Today we have a special guest with us. Um, Tim, most of you, I think, know Tim. I mean, he's been around a bit. Uh, and he is a professor in the philosophy department here. And Tom Gilson is, uh, uh, what is it, countrywide? National uh, field director. National field yeah. director for Ratio Christi. So he goes from place to place, sort of uh, checking things out helping people out, talking to people, helping uh, directors and, and things. And you spent, what was it, 30 some years with crew? Yeah. Before, before coming on board with, with, uh, with Rafael and Christy. So we're really happy to have both of them here tonight. And they're gonna be talking about a very important subject. Uh, something that we've mentioned here before, uh, something called street epistemology. And so I'll let these guys explain it uh, and what it is and, what we can uh, do about it, but I'll just leave it to you guys from this point. Thanks, John. Are we rolling there? I think we're rolling. I mean, it's really a privilege to be here. I am excited to be here. This is, uh, it's a treat to be here with Tim in particular, because he's got such an incredible reputation. I don't know if you know how, uh, how blessed you are to be here, but um, he is not only brilliant, but he's a nice guy, and that's a Tremendous, you're not. <laughs> you're, he doesn't know me very well. Does yeah, he? <laughs> so he's, it's just that's just a great combination. So, so thanks, Tim, for letting me oh, um, come here, and thank you all for letting me come in and join you too. So, um, we are we we had the privilege of collaborating together on a book called True Reason, which I edited. Carson Whitenauer, who is now the U.S. Director for Ravi Zacharias Ministries, you might have heard of Ravi is the co-editor with me, and it is, the, the subtitle is Confronting the Irrationality of the New Atheism, which just released a few weeks ago by Craigle Publications, and it's got an interesting history to it that we won't go into it, but part of the history is that um, there was one example of New Atheist Irrationality that came along too late for us to put in the book. There is, the New Atheists present themselves as the party of reason. The Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science. Sam Harris has Project Reason. If you look at atheist or secular humanist websites, you'll find their reason is their value, and they're always talking about let's, let's uh, promote reason instead of religion. And the reason we, reason we wrote this book is because the, the new atheist claims on reason turn out to be pretty empty. They have a, they have a, a weakness rather than a strength in that area. And I'm not talking about every atheist, I'm not talking about the better thinkers among the atheists, but I am talking about the, the ones that are selling a lot of books and getting a lot of hits on their websites, like Richard Dawkins, Jerry Coyne, Lawrence Krauss. Lawrence Krauss, yes. And there is there is a, a big gap between their claims and their reality. And the biggest one of them all lately has come from Peter Boghossian, who wrote a manual for creating atheists. And this is the book that came out about a month too late, because we didn't get a chapter in True Reason about this. Anyway, uh, Tim is one of the uh, contributors to it, did a, um, helped us with a chapter on the historic relationship, that had the tight relationship between faith and reason down through the ages. And you can probably quote some of those from memory if I know you. They can read the book. They can read the book. That's an even better idea. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, I, I had the privilege of collaborating with David Marshall, who's uh, got a doctorate in comparative religion. And we just went through church history, taking examples of statements regarding faith and reason. And, and we discussed all, a whole bunch of them, including some of the famous ones, for example, or Tertullian's famous, often misquoted statement, and tried to put that in context and see what he's really getting at, and just tried to set the record straight with respect to the relation between faith and reason. And it is, Tertullian's comment was, I uh, believe... Right, it is absurd, uh, it is impossible, therefore it is by all means to be believed, or something like something that, like speaking that, of yes. the resurrection. And Tertullian isn't saying there what it sounds like he's saying, if you take just that snippet, you ignore all the context, you ignore the history 
of rhetoric from Aristotle onward, and you just try to take it in isolation. But that, of course, is a modus operandi for many of these people. They will take a quotation out of context, and then they will proceed to mock it, right? That sounds barking mad, doesn't it, to say, well, it's impossible, therefore I believe it. You believe impossible things all the time? Uh, that isn't what Tertullian is trying to say. We explain in the chapter the backdrop of some of these things and show that there is a very long-standing, strong, deep current of thought in the Christian tradition that says that faith and reason are compatible and indeed that reason is a component of a vibrant faith. So that was the part that we worked on for that one. Unfortunately, Peter Boghossian, in the book that we're going to be discussing tonight, has a very different view. He starts out with a definition of faith which he's got his own uh, take on that, and it's not a very flattering take, and he's very insistent that it's the only right one, and that would have made great fodder for our chapter if only we had seen it before the book was in publication. Right. Boghossian says, right off at the beginning of the book, faith has two definitions, and if you look at his online presentations, it's not so blatantly expressed in this book, but in his online presentations, he makes it very clear that there are only two definitions of faith. It is belief without evidence or pretending to know things you don't know. It is every instance of the word faith is either belief without evidence or pretending to know things with, that you don't know. He says that it is definitive of faith that it is pretending. And that, by the way, if you use the word faith in any context other than religion, that's, that's wrong. It, it, the, the word faith only applies in religious contexts, and it's always belief without evidence, and it's always pretending to know things you don't know. And the reason Boghossian's important on this point is a couple. One is that he is really building what he calls an army of street epistemologists, which is a we'll, term we'll, we'll explain later, but it's um, people who are, whom he's training through this manual. And it, the book has gone, went quickly into a second printing. It's gotten a lot of attention in the, um, on the atheist internet, at least. But another reason it's really important is because the, the way vocabulary works, if you can redefine a word, you redefine everything. Tolerance has been redefined. Truth has been redefined. Hate has been redefined. And if the word faith is redefined, then then what comes, he says, every time you hear the word faith, you should replace it with pretending to know things you don't know. Freedom of faith is freedom of pretending to know things you don't know. International Faith Convention is international pretending to know things you don't know convention. And for us to talk about what Christianity teaches, the just shall live by what? pretending to know things we don't know. And if you have kids and you're raising them in the pretense, how are you going to get to the point of actually explaining what you're talking about when you have to back up so far and, 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 and unteach what Boghossian hopes to teach? It's really strategically important. And I think that it's worth recognizing the historical background of this. Many of you have read George Orwell's novel, 1984. If you have, you remember that one of the key techniques of propaganda is the control of the meanings of key words. If you can define the key terms, you can control the debate. And one of the effects of insisting upon this redefinition of faith as the only one, the one that you must always stick to, that you must insist upon, is that it, in significant measure, diminishes, even dehumanizes, the people whom he is critiquing. And that's a very effective part of propaganda, especially when it's propaganda directed against a particular group. You want to dehumanize them, show them to be unworthy of being considered to be rational agents. And Boghossian's other rhetoric is all of a piece with this. He will speak, for example, of denying people who are committed to faith a seat at the adult table. They get to seat, seat, sit with the kids right, in the make-believe room, but they don't get to have a seat at the adult table and make adult conversation. Chapter 9 in the book. So this redefinition of a word 
is a rallying point for his street epistemologists, but it's more than just a rallying cry. It's also an attempt to turn the wider cultural perception of Christianity and other religious traditions as well in a direction that will make it easier to mock them, easier to ignore them, easier to push them to the margins, and perhaps, ultimately, easier to attempt to eradicate them. Oh, that's in chapter 9, too. Right, he says that... He uses the word eradicate. He says the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Illness, which the World Health Organization puts out every few years, needs to remove the exemption for religious beliefs among the delusions. That is, include religious belief as a delusion. This will make it possible, he says, for academicians and clinicians to explore ways of overcoming these mental illnesses, which are faith beliefs. Right. Now, Tim, what is, what's a street epistemologist? And first of all, before that, what's an epistemologist? Right, well, it's a guy who uh, looks at a lot of bugs, right? No, that's yeah. entomologist. Entomologist, a, right. <laughs> epistemology is, comes from a Greek word meaning knowledge, and so epistemology is the theory of knowledge. It's a branch of philosophy. It's very old. You may take a philosophy course where you go all the way back to Plato and read the Theotetus or the Meno as part of your education in the theory of knowledge. And there's a strong, active branch of philosophy called epistemology today. This is one of the areas I specialize in. Bogosian's co-opted the word, and he likes to co-opt words. This one, he's taken the word epistemologist, and he's defined what he calls a street epistemologist as someone who's trained to deal with epistemological issues at the level of the guy on the street. So his hope is that by using the techniques that he outlines in his book, and he is systematic, he's thorough, about this. He's very intentional about this. People will be able to engage others in conversations which ultimately will have the effect of undermining their faulty epistemology, their faulty ways of knowing. Because faith, he says, is a faulty way of knowing. Now put that together with a definition Tom was just quoting. Well, yeah, pretending to know things you don't is a faulty way of knowing, right? So if you define faith that way, then faith is a bad epistemology. He does not think it's possible, and in this he's right, to take 10,000 people with no training in philosophy and turn them into epistemologists in the professional sense. That's not his goal. He just wants to give them enough that they could go out on the street with the tools he's given them and do the job that he wants them to do, which is the job of undermining faith. That's his goal. You might think, you know, what's some handful of techniques going to do? And the answer is, if more Christians knew not only what they believe, but why they believe it, there would be very little to be worried about, very little to talk about here, because it would just fall flat. He would encounter people who would be prepared, they would give a reasonable answer, his street epistemologists might in some cases become Christians themselves. End of story. But in fact, we need to own up to the fact that at this stage in the 21st century, the church has not done a good job of telling people why they ought to believe the things they believe. As a result, you've got people who absorb what their Christian community is teaching rather like a sponge absorbs whatever you set it down in. And then they go off to college and they get put out under a little pressure and it all comes back out again. So people who have never been shown the rationality of their religious beliefs are easily talked out of them. And the techniques that Boghossian is endorsing and teaching, though they are sometimes...